Okay, Luke Acts for uh, beginners. This is lesson number 16, Persecution of Peter and the Apostles. We're going to be covering Acts 5, 1 to 42. Uh, as we do uh, each time, let's take a look at our outline as we follow the first section of Acts dealing primarily with the uh, ministry of Peter the Apostle. So far, Peter's first sermon, Acts 1 to Acts 2. Peter's post-Pentecost ministry, Acts 3 to 4, and the persecution of Peter and the apostles that we're going to be looking at today. Now in our last lesson we left off where the church in Jerusalem was rejoicing, experiencing spiritual power at the release of Peter and John by the Jewish leaders. And this joy would soon turn to concern as a new wave of persecution would be experienced again by Peter and this time and the apostles together. So let's, I want to uh, go back here and, um, and uh, read about uh, you know, the, the, the situation in the church where we left off last week. So it says here, now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, and who owned a tract of land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So we go back here and we read about the joy and spiritual momentum of the church experienced as a result of Peter's, you know, his bold witness before and subsequent released by the Jewish leader. So the church is really pumped. Now part of this enthusiasm affected the giving by the members of the church as they gave generously and willingly to, uh, to care for the needs of the young and the growing church. Can you imagine if in one day this congregation added 3,000 members? I mean, you know, where would you put them all? 3,000 members, that means some of them are sick, some of them are aged, some of them have needs. So uh, they were scrambling to take care of needs and uh, different individuals in the church were stepping up to meet the needs of the church and they mentioned here uh, Barnabas as one of those individuals that sold a piece of land and brought the proceeds to the uh, apostles for the use uh, of the church at that time. So in, into this spirit of generosity, Luke inserts an unusual episode of fraud perpetrated by a husband and wife who were also members of this very same Assembly. So we jump into chapter five now and read the following. It says, but a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came over all who heard it. The young men got up and covered him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. So I want you to note a couple of things about this action and why it was so serious. First of all, they were pretending to duplicate the giving done by Barnabas. In other words, sell a piece of land and give all the proceeds of the sale to the church. Secondly, Luke mentions that both the man and his wife together plotted the fraud in advance. They planned to sell the land, keep a portion for themselves, and then give the balance to the church pretending that they were turning over all the proceeds to the church. Now the sin was not the fact that they kept some of the money for themselves. You know, Peter said that the land and the money, um, it was rightly theirs, it was in their control. They, they could choose to give whatever they wanted to give. No, the, the sin was creating the lie concerning their giving. They pretended to give all of the proceeds but in fact, kept some of it back for themselves. Now, the gravity of the sin was not based on then keeping the money, but as Peter states, believing they could lie to the Holy Spirit and think they would get away with this kind of, with this kind of fraud. So their failing was not greed, their failing was faith. Their faith in Christ was so weak, it was so faded, 
that they could come up with a scheme like this in order to be praised as generous by other Christians. So Ananias dies instantly, goes to judgment without a chance to repent, chance to grow. Note the effect on the church is no longer enthusiasm or spiritual power, but fear. Fear for what has just happened before them and possibly fear as they search their own hearts and actions for signs of greed and insincerity. Isn't that what happens? Again, I keep coming back to this idea. It's so human. Something happens to somebody in the church or whatever and we, we, we think of ourselves, oh wow, I wonder if that was me. And you know, it gives rise to a lot of soul searching. So let's keep reading. <clears throat> Verse seven says, now, the, now there elapsed an interval of about three hours. And his wife came in not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. She said, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, why is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead. And they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard these things. So note that Peter gives Sapphira a chance to confess the wrong, to repent, to receive forgiveness. But she doubles down on the lie and experiences the same fate as her husband. Note also that Peter confronts her with her sins, to conspire, to defraud the church, to lie to the Holy Spirit. This time Luke says that fear not only came on those who heard of this incident, but also the entire church and everybody who heard about this. So this is the first time in the book of Acts that this term church, by the way, is used. First time. Uh, from the Greek word meaning the called out. Actually the word in the Greek originally referred to city leaders who were called out, who were selected you know, to serve as the leaders of the city council, if you wish. But eventually the word was used exclusively to refer to the body of believers in, in Christ. So after describing this particular episode, Luke provides a, a kind of a wider view of the situation in Jerusalem as the church was experiencing dramatic growth, largely due to the dynamic ministry of Peter and the apostles. So in verse 12, 13, we keep reading. At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico, but none of the rest dared to associate with them. However, the people held them in high esteem. So Luke describes um, uh, the location where the church met, Solomon's porch. Here's an artist's rendition of that. This was a, an open promenade in the temple complex which could accommodate thousands of people. Uh, he notes the unity of the young church as well as its favor with the people. Even though they were afraid to join them on account of the Jewish leaders, they still respected these these people. So we keep reading, verse 14. And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women, were constantly added to their number, to such an extent that they even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets, so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on uh, any of them. Also, the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. So here we see the kind of the widening influence of the apostles' ministry as more and more people came to Christ and their healing ministry opened the door of opportunity for you know, reaching people with the gospel who live beyond the city of Jerusalem. So the miracles always followed by the preaching, always followed by the conversions. The miracles weren't simply a show. It wasn't just a show of power. The miracles were there to set up the opportunity to preach and to receive people into Christ. So all of this fulfilling Jesus' promise that they would be His witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, which was now happening, and Samaria, even to the remotest parts of the earth. And of course, when we start reading about Paul's ministry, we read about to the remotest parts of the earth because Paul is the one that brings the gospel 
out into the uh, Roman Empire and beyond. So we read about the next persecution that comes up in chapter five. Skip ahead to verse uh, 17. It says, but the high priest rose up along with all his associates, that is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. They laid hands on the apostles and put them in public jail, in a public jail. But during the night an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison and taking them out he said, Go, stand and speak to the people in the temple the whole message of this life. Upon hearing this, they entered into the temple about daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest and his associates came, they called the council together, even all the senate of the sons of Israel, and sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought. But the officers who came did not find them in the prison, and they returned and reported uh, back saying, we found the prison house locked quite securely and the guards standing at the doors, but when we had opened up, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them as to what would, um, what would come of this. But someone came and reported to them, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. So they had been arrested before in Acts chapter four and warned not to preach about Christ. As more and more people were converted and met in the temple area, the leaders were not only jealous, but fearful that this movement would threaten their own stability. Wait a minute, these guys are having more supporters than us. So, when the leaders, so after this you know, first address, they were released by the Jewish leaders with a warning. But this time, they are miraculously released by an angel and told to continue with their preaching in the temple area. Last time they only arrested a couple of apostles, this time they arrest all of them. So when the leaders send for them, the guards not only report that they're gone, but that the apostles had returned to the temple to preach. How's that for defiance? So we look at the, the third arrest, that's three times now, we're going to see a third arrest. Verse 26, it says, Then the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence, for they were afraid of the people that they might be stoned. When they had brought them, they stood them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior, to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. So there's Peter's events. They arrest them once again, with care this time, fearing the people and they bring them before the Jewish leaders to be questioned one more time. Now at their first address, the leaders wanted to know, by what authority do you do these things? In other words, preach Christ, heal, you know what? What authority do you have? And back at that time, Peter answered the first time. He says, well, we're doing it by Jesus' authority. And you remember this Jesus that you guys crucified and may I remind you that God raised from the dead. And the conclusion is, He is the Messiah according to prophecy. And then Peter quotes the Old Testament scripture. You know, the stone rejected by the builders has become the cornerstone. That's a messianic prophecy. And then he finishes, this is his first defense. He finishes with, and He is the only Savior of all men. Only name under heaven by which we can be saved, Acts 4.12, right? This time, their tone is different. It's almost self-defensive. I mean, the, uh, the leaders, the Jewish leaders. They're saying, why do you continue doing this? You know, preach and heal. Do you want to have us bear the guilt for Jesus' death? It's no longer, who do you think you are? Who gave you this authority? Do you know who we are? We're in charge, not you. you know, that was the first time. This time it's no longer like that. It's like, hey, you're going to get us into trouble. 
They were being disingenuous since they knew exactly what they had done in order to force Pilate into executing Jesus. They don't even, do you notice? They don't even mention his name. You, you, you're you're going to bring the guilt of this man's blood, not Jesus' blood. They don't, even give, they don't even respect by giving him his name. They just call him the man, Jesus. Which is a way of saying to us readers, they still didn't believe. He was just a man. Imagine, in the face of all of this, you know, miracles that are undeniable at the hand of these ordinary fishermen, still they refused to believe. So Peter's answer repeats some of the points that he made to them last time that they questioned him. This time, it's a, he says that this teaching and healing power is from God. He says it was the leaders who put Jesus to death. This sin is there. They're saying, hey, you're going to bring the guilt of this man's blood on our head. And Peter says, yeah, that's right, because that's where it belongs. You were the guys that did it. And then he says, God, however, raised Jesus up. And at this point, Peter adds more points to his response. He says, Jesus is now in heaven, occupying a place of authority and power at the right hand of God. Ironically, if they are guilty, Jesus is the only one that they, as Jews, can appeal to for forgiveness. The one that they killed. Do you see the tight spot that these leaders are in? Peter is saying to them, you killed the Messiah. Oh, and by the way, the only way you can be forgiven is through Him. <laughs> Talk about nowhere to go. So the teaching and the miracles they see, according to Peter, are a result of the Holy Spirit who empowers them and who indwells all who believe and obey the gospel. He's even giving them a chance to respond to the gospel. He's no longer defending himself. He's becoming aggressive and appealing to them. So we see in this short excerpt Peter's boldness and insight. We see it grow. He refused to stop preaching and healing. He continues to accuse them of killing Jesus, their Messiah. He proclaims Jesus as the only Savior of both Jews and Gentiles. He reveals the Lord's position in heaven and he claims that he is the source of their power to preach and to heal. So Peter, he's not groveling here. He's not fearful here before them. He causes jealousy and anger, but also he forces them to stop and think over what they are going to do. And so now the scene shifts. You know, it's like a scene in a movie or in a play. You know, the, the camera's on Peter and his defense and his eloquent and powerful defense. Now the camera moves back to the, uh, to the leaders. What are they going to do? What happens? So in uh, Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 33, it says, but when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and intended to kill them. You know, when he said, this is the Jesus you killed, you know, and he's the Messiah, and he's at the right hand of heaven. So when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and intended to kill them. But a Pharisee named uh, Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up in the council and gave orders to put the men outside for a short time. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you propose to do with these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined up with him. But he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan of action is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may even be found fighting against God. So Gamaliel was an expert in the law, and if you remember correctly, he was a teacher who was a member of the Sanhedrin, and who else did he teach? Well, he taught Saul. He was te Saul's teacher, now Paul. So his intervention saved their lives because Peter's reply had enraged the leaders. Peter must have known that the content and the boldness of his response would probably get them killed, but he spoke anyways. 
What's interesting here is that God chose and used one of the men that opposed the apostles to actually save them, Gamaliel. And, and in my own mind, I was thinking, you never know how God is going to rescue you and who He's going to use to help you. Sometimes the last person in the world that you think is going to help you or rescue you or you know, come to your aid, and that person is, is, is there. And in this case, the last person they thought that would save them was one of the people on the, on the council. So Gamaliel's advice you know, is wait and see, don't do anything rash, is accepted by the leaders. The Bible mentions him, as I said, as Paul's teacher before he was converted, before Paul was converted, Saul was converted in Acts 22.3, but there's no other reference to him after that. Interesting again that Luke is always mentioning you know, people and places and things where you can fix the history. Like Gamaliel, we know that this is a real person. He's not only quote in the Bible, but he's mentioned also in historical literature about you know, that period of time in Jewish history. So Luke is always trying to make sure that you know, he puts these pegs on which you can hang the story, uh, historical and geog uh, geographical pegs. So that's, that's one of them, he mentions the name. He could have just said one of the council members, but he names him, he names the one that, uh, that did this. Um, the Bible mentions him, as, um, uh, as I said, already uh, mentions him as Paul's teacher. Now, according to Photios, a ninth century church leader, Gamaliel was, or Gamaliel rather, was eventually baptized along with his two sons by Peter and John and died in 52 AD. A little postscript about this man here who stood and defended the apostles. All right, so now we see the punishment coming in chapter five, verse 40. It says, they took his advice and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then released them. So they went on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for His name. And every day in the temple and from house to house they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So the leaders follow Gamaliel's counsel to prudence, but in a repeated effort to frighten and discourage the apostles, they warn them to stop their preaching and they highlight this warning by torturing them. Flogging or flaying was 39 strikes on the back and on the sides with rods. And you read about this in Matthew 10, also 2 Corinthians. So it's amazing how Paul, uh, Luke you know, just kind of skips over this. You know, he gives it four or five words. They warned them, they flogged them, they threw them out, they flogged them. If any one of us had been flogged, believe me, we'd be at the emergency room after and we'd be laid up and we'd be off of work and we'd be along. You know, it was a terrible, terrible torture. Uh, people died from that type of, of, of uh, torture. But note that all the apostles endured the beating, not just Peter or John, all of them. All of them endured the beating. And their reaction was the complete opposite of what the Jewish leaders expected. They expected them to respond with fear, discouragement, please don't hurt me anymore, right? <laughs> Even doubting their own cause and mission. But Luke writes that they rejoiced because this event proved several things. Number one, it proved that they were sincerely faithful taking this beating and receiving these threats without losing faith proved the quality and the strength of their own faith. How many times have we, how many times in our lives, after having gone through a serious illness of our, our own or someone in our family, a death of someone we love, a tragedy of some kind, a child is injured and maimed for life, a divorce, the death of a spouse, you know, we go through stuff, we lose our job, our business goes belly up and we don't know, you know from one day to the next how we're going to make it. And you know, we somehow make it through and we look back on that time and what, how many times have I heard people say this? I do not know how we got through that. I can't tell you how, how we made it through that time. I, I, how did we do that? How did we not just go under and totally be destroyed? 
or I don't know how it is I, I didn't quit, I just never quit on God, I never quit believing, but boy, I just don't know how I made it through. <laughs> well, this is exactly what's going on here. They've been threatened by the most powerful people that they knew in their world, beaten to within an inch of their lives, and yet they made it through. They continued believing. They just couldn't beat the faith out of them. And isn't that what happens in our own lives sometimes? The world and Satan just cannot scare or beat or destroy or chase the faith out of us. It's almost like you're saying to him, well, you can just keep on hitting. You can just keep beating me if you wish, but I'm sorry, <laughs> you'll never be able to beat the faith out of me, so you might as well kill me. And this is, this is the feeling that they have, something we can relate to. It also proved the sureness of Jesus' word and promise. What did he say, Jesus? Way back in Matthew, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves, but beware of the men, for they will hand you over, where? To the courts and scourge you in their synagogues, meaning you're going to be beaten by your own brethren, the Jews. And you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given to you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Don't you think those words came back to them after they walked out, after you know, the episode with the, with the Jewish leaders? The bad thing that he said would happen did take place, but so did the promise to know what to say when the critical moment arrived. You know, they say that um, I have read reports, studies of, on, on military people, you know, all kind of those military people who were actually in battle, you know, saw a, a battle. And they said uh, military people would rather be killed than be cowards. They would rather be killed than be, be a coward, be known as being a coward. And I think this is the same thing here. These men would rather have died than have failed in their mission for Christ. And so they were quite strengthened when they realized, you know what? We were in the fire, we faced death, we didn't quit. We kept going. And it's the same thing with us. It may not be the, uh, the council of Jews that we're facing, maybe cancer is what we're facing. Or maybe we're facing something that is so unfair, so unjust, something we so do not deserve in our lives. And somehow God gives us not the eloquence or the words, but He gives us the faith. He gives us the strength or the courage not to overcome the disease, sometimes the disease takes us out. No, he gives us the strength to remain faithful, whether we live or whether we die, whether we win or we lose, we stay faithful. Another thing that this episode demonstrated to them, it demonstrated the weakness of the, uh, of the, of the opposition. You know, Peter had now spoken before the Jewish leaders twice, and both times they had no response, no counter argument to his preaching of the gospel. These supposed teachers, wise men, leaders of Israel, had no answer to the accusations and proclamations of a humble fisherman from Galilee, untrained. And God considered them worthy or faithful enough to suffer for the name of Christ. He considered their faith strong enough that he allowed them to suffer knowing that their faith would not break. You know when it says that God won't give us more than we can handle? That's not a physical thing. No, He won't give us more than we can handle without losing our faith. That's the breaking point. The breaking point is not where you start to cry, I can't take it anymore. That's not the breaking point. The breaking point is I don't believe in God anymore. That's the breaking point. 
And God promises, I, I want to allow the evil one to put something on you that'll break your faith. They didn't invite rejection and violence, but when it happened because of their faith, they were fully assured that they were following Jesus' lead, who also suffered for doing God's will. Since the beating was administered in the presence of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders, the joyful reaction of the apostles must have been disquieting to these men looking on. <laughs> what do we have to do to these guys to get them to quit? <laughs> we, we nearly beat them to death and they're rejoicing. So Luke ends this section by noting a new element in the development of the early church, and that is house to house teaching and uh, preaching. This was, this was probably done for two reasons. First, the congregation was becoming way too large to minister to by coming together in a single place. They had thousands of people. You know, eventually, you know, believe it or not, there's a point where a church gets just too big to minister to. You know, these 20,000 member churches, I mean, they're, they're corporations. And usually the way that these huge churches manages is they break, they break it down into smaller, you know, you've got really small churches all integrated into one. So this was their problem, it was just getting unwieldy. And secondly, to avoid the mounting opposition of the Jewish leaders who control the temple area where the church met. I mean, imagine <laughs> going into the uh, St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome and starting to have Bible studies there. <laughs> and you know, you, you start to have Bible studies and we start you know, going down to the river and baptizing people and then bringing them back to St. Peter's Basilica. I'm not, I'm not uh, disrespecting St. Peter's Basilica, but imagine if something like that happened. Eventually, the priest or the bishop in charge of that area would say, who are you people? <laughs> what are you doing here? You know? Well, this is kind of what is happening in the temple area. They're starting to become disruptive. They're too big. All right, a couple of lessons from this uh, particular passage here. Lesson number one, God knows. I know that's, you know, you all know that, but God knows. Peter knew about the deception of Ananias and Sapphira because it was revealed to him, how? By God's Spirit. It's amazing how believers who should know better think that they can hide their sins or motivations from God. In the end, it is not our spouses or friends or even ourselves that will judge us. It is the all-knowing God who will judge us. What does it say? But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. That is a very scary thing. So God knows, He knows everything, for good or for evil, remember? For good, He knows everything for good, but He also knows everything for evil. Lesson number two, there is always a cost. Luke writes that many were becoming Christians but the majority of the people, even though they respected them, would not join them. I mean, it's nice that they respected them, but respect does not save you or forgive your sins. Faith and obedience, that's what forgives you. That's what saves you. So even though these people respected the sincerity and the spirituality and the loving kindness of the disciples, they would not pay the price. And what was the price? Well, faith and possible rejection by their family or friends, Jewish family or friends. And so they were left to observe and to admire something they would never have. And that is a spirit-filled and eternal life. So there's always a cost. You remember when you I might add something to this, and I don't have it as a, you know, a slide. There's always a cost for doing God's will, but there's always a reward as well. There's always a reward. And the reward always outweighs the cost. You need to keep that in mind. And then maybe one other lesson here. God is stronger. 
We need to remember in times of trouble and sorrow that God is stronger than what opposes us. We may not be stronger than what is hurting us, but God is. I mean, Luke describes the battle lines in the book of Acts. There are the battle lines, the Jewish leadership, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the lawyers, the, the rabbi, you know, the elite, the rich, the educated, the powerful politically. That's on one side. Tradition, the Roman Empire was providing the muscle, if you wish, to back up the things that they wanted to do. And the pagan world was there. That was on one side of the equation. The other side were 12 apostles and a young church. So with the blessing of hindsight, we know that each of these were eventually overtaken to make way for Jesus' word and His church. The Jewish leadership, well, the nation was destroyed in 70 AD. By who? By the Romans. And eventually the, the, the Roman Empire itself, a couple of centuries later, crumbled and yet the church still continued to grow. And the pagan world, well, it's still there today, but Christianity is still there today as well. God is always stronger. John says, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. So let's keep this in mind when we're discouraged. The spirit of God that dwells in you is greater than the spirit of the one who rules this world. This may not always be evident, but the final proof of it will be when He strikes the final victorious blow by raising us from the dead and thus destroying the evil one and all that opposes us once and forevermore. And do we not look forward to that? Amen. All right, let me give you the assignment next week, chapter six, verse one, to chapter seven, verse 60. Please read up on that. As I mentioned each week, I don't read the whole, we just don't have time to read all the text in class, but I would appreciate it if you would read the text so you know what I'm talking about. All right, thank you very much. That's our lesson for today.